what are some things we can learn from 31 years in the utility communication space? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of the Story Connect podcast. My name is Andy Johns, your host with Pioneer, and I'm joined on this special episode uh, by Mike Teagarden, who is the editorial director at Pioneer. Mike, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Andy. So, like I said, it's kind of a special episode. Um, Mike is headed towards retirement. He can you can see the sunset that he's riding off into um, in his utility communications career. Mike, I'll just hit some of the the basics of that um, after a uh, after a career in newspapers in the early 90s in um, uh, Idaho and California. Mike came to Pioneer um, right at about 31 years ago. Um, he's worked at a couple of different roles at Pioneer, um, usually as a photography extraordinaire. And that's, you know, all of those pieces are, are what we're going to get into. The last few years of Mike's tenure here, he's been editorial director overseeing all the electric magazines um, and uh, editorial production that we do at Pioneer. So, Mike, congratulations. Thank you very much. It's, it's, it's exciting. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it's a whole mixture of emotions. There's uh, there's all sorts of uh, all sorts of stuff going into that. I guess let's let's start with the fun stuff. Uh, what's the plan for uh, for retirement? A lot of pickleball, some golf, I imagine. A little pickleball, a little golf. I I actually I actually have a job working part time in a pickleball gym, and oh. um, and so uh, I I plan to continue doing that. Um, I'll I'll be. I'll still be a photographer as opportunities present. Um, I'll, I'll be able to pursue personal projects that I haven't had time or energy for. Um, I I don't really have any other real hard plans. I, I I'm going to enjoy you know the last couple of years of my kids' college and um, being able to spend time with them before they they rush off and and start their adult life lives. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's. Nothing hard and fast. I, I'm I'm gonna kind of see where the wind blows me. Well, that sounds like a good start. Spending some time in the in the pickleball gym. That's uh, that's great. You mentioned photography. Let's start there because that's where you started, um, and you've seen it changed. I imagine you know early '90s. You were you guys were developing it um, in the dark room with the chemicals and and all that, and then it's moved into uh, into you know digital, and then now it's moved into AI. I mean, there's there's all kinds of uh, changes that have been to photography. But I think you know, when we were talking before, before the um, before we hit the record button, you know, there's a big difference between photography and good photography. Tell us a little bit about what the difference is between uh, between the two. Yeah, well, that that's a that's a fair comparison. I I, I think I, I tell people um, the difference between a professional photographer and an amateur photographer is an amateur photographer will see something interesting. They'll go up and they'll take a picture. And they'll look at their camera because we can do that now. And they'll say, oh, look, I got it in focus. It's exposed right. I nailed it. I'm done. I'm out of here. And a professional will come in and they'll shoot that photo, the same photo. And then they'll walk around to the left side and they'll shoot some photos from that side. And then they'll walk around behind and they'll keep shooting and they'll keep trying different things until they get something that is extraordinary. It's not any, I mean, it's really about the time they put into making that photo and going the extra mile to make it, take it from ordinary to extraordinary. And, and really, I think anyone is capable of doing that. We just have to remember that it takes effort and put that time in. Let's talk about that effort and time. Um, can you remember some, some times where it took extraordinary effort or, any particular um, shots or, or setups where, or you had to, um, you had to kind of put in that extraordinary effort to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to get there and get the shot. I mean, I know, you know, you shot stuff from um, the Pacific Northwest all the way down to Guatemala, um, you know, all over the place, but what are some times if you can recall that, that just took that extra effort to, to really get that extraordinary shot? Yeah. So, um, you know, one comes to mind, um, Years ago, uh, we were doing a story on wind turbines in the Columbia Gorge, and um, we wanted to photograph Jeff Davis uh, at, um, at one of the wind farms. But we didn't just want an ordinary photo of, of him standing in the field with the wind farms. I wanted, to, I wanted to photograph him with that blue light, that early morning blue light. Um, so we convinced him to meet us at like five in the morning 
uh, out in a cold farm field um, with the wind turbines, just us. And I brought uh, I brought some battery powered lights with me, and we were out there just freezing cold. Um, I bet. And 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 he was. And we brought a chair with us so he could have a kind of a prop to use to to put his foot up, and uh, it was it was really cool. Um, and, and we ended up with a wonderful photo, um, and it, it, we ran it really large. He really liked it. Um, and, and that effort made it worth it. Sounds like it. Let's, uh, that's a good transition to the next point, which is about storytelling, uh, in general, whether it's the, the effort that goes into the photography side or, or into the, the writing side of it, why does storytelling matter? in the utility communication space, uh, you know, have you seen any changes, um, in, in 31 years? I know so much of, so much of what's true about storytelling, whether it's photography and visual communications or, um, or text is, is true, no matter the medium, no matter the era, but what are some of the changes that you've seen in storytelling and why does photography, I'm sorry, why does storytelling still matter in, uh, in utility communications? Yeah, well, you know, when I first started, we kind of had a formula in the magazine um, with uh, storytelling. And this was Rural Light Magazine, which was the only magazine we did at the time. And um, every utility, pretty much every single one ran a feature story on someone in their community. It didn't have anything to do with electricity. It was just someone in the community who did something interesting. Maybe they were a volunteer. Maybe they collected ceramic frogs. Maybe they they sure. built dugout canoes, right? I mean, you just never knew what you're going to get. But it was always a story about someone in the community, and um, that was that was the enticement of the readers to pick up the magazine and look inside and see what one of their neighbors was doing. And it works really well. It's still a really good way to get people to pick up the magazine and look inside. And it's not that the utility industry isn't exciting and interesting, but for some people, it may not be enough to get them to pick that magazine up. So with these human interest stories, the neighbors, their friends, it gets them to pick up the magazine and they're reading that and then they're turning pages and they're seeing the safety stories. They're seeing the industry stories. They're seeing the, the stories about rates, they're seeing the, the stories about elections and board meetings and annual meetings, and they're absorbing that information as well in the process. And uh, through the years, we've seen a little bit of a trend. Some utilities have are spending more of their focus on the industry stories, and they're not doing as much with those human interest stories. And I think that's maybe a mistake. I'd like to see more of that human interest um, element in their communications. I just think it's important that we continue to have that touch point with our, our members, our, our readers. Um, they want to know who their neighbors are. And, you know, we've heard how many newspapers are closing. You know, every day a newspaper closes or two or three True. close. And, and so there's no one in that community documenting what's going on. And, and our magazines have become the only voice in town sometimes uh, for what's going on and, and the only way of documenting that history. And, um, and so I, I think that's, that's something we don't want to lose. Um, and, and I know our readers love it. They, you know, we still get calls today. Um, my aunt or my uncle was in the magazine in 1964. Do you think you could find a copy of that and send it to me? And, and it's just, it's amazing. Um, and of course we don't have the printed copies that we can send them. Um, but we, we have copies that we can photocopy and send them. And mm -hmm. they're so happy. They love seeing their family. They love being able to read about that history. Uh, it's meaningful to them. It's, and it's, it's historic. It's, it's part of the fiber of those communities. And, um, if we lose that, that's a big loss. So, and the utilities can take a big role in that. And, and that continues to cement that relationship with, with their members. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, kind of moving beyond the transactional um, relationship has always been a big part of what, what the magazines uh, are all about. 
You talked about how the role of the magazine has changed. The role of the storyteller has changed. Uh, your role changed quite a bit over the years, um, including early on, um, you know, being, being the new guy, um, where there was, and I think I know the answer to this one. Is there, uh, any particular assignment that you ever got that you just dreaded, um, <laughs> dreaded doing? I know, I know that your, your role has changed quite a bit over the years. Um, you know, a lot of folks, do their whole career um, as the photographer and, and happy doing that or whatever the role is you've, your job has, has, has changed and morphed a little bit over the years. Tell us a little bit about uh, any particular early career assignments, maybe that you were a little apprehensive about. Well, when I first started here, I, I came in from being a newspaper photographer and um, you know, my role was to go out and take pictures and come back and, develop them and print them and hand them off to somebody else. And um, I, I didn't really talk to a lot of people. Uh, I was, I was, uh, you know, I was a typical photographer, happy to be behind the camera. Um, mm. And um, when I started here, it wasn't long before Curtis Condon, the editor at the time, uh, uh, told me that uh, the, uh, the newest editor uh, was responsible for planning the uh, writer's workshop, which is uh, a, a, a semi-annual event every two years um, that uh, we brought in our freelance writers and communicators from utilities to um, give them some help with writing and photography. And I've never planned a workshop. I would never really been to a workshop. I didn't know what I was doing. And, um, there wasn't really a great blueprint to follow. Um, and it's like, are you sure you want me to do this? <laughs> like, oh yeah. Yeah. You're going to have to do this. Okay. So, sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, that's the way it goes for the new guy. Sometimes I guess. That's right. So I kind of rolled up my sleeves, looked around and, and, you know, we didn't have a very big staff back then. Um, and, um, and so I was kind of on my own and, but fortunately I knew some photographers that I could bring in and, um, we planned one and I was, I thought I was doing pretty well. Cause I had, I had the photographers lined up. I had the hotel lined up. We, we hosted it in Forest Grove, Oregon, which is where the office was located at. And, um, we, I think we had, I don't know, maybe 25 people that came, which was a good attendance. For us, sure, we, were, yeah. we were happy about that number, um, yeah. and I and I had this crazy idea to use um, uh, uh, actual hands-on photography where we we had people shoot, but that was in film days, so we actually shot film and got them got the film processed uh, and brought prints back to look at. Um, what I didn't count on was uh, Curtis telling me, "By the way, you know you have to MC this, right?" I was like, "Oh." what what oh yeah someone has to you know talk and introduce people and that was really outside my comfort zone even hmm. even with just uh you know 20 25 people i was really uncomfortable with that but he said you'll figure it out and and i did it and it wasn't so bad hmm. i i didn't hate it and um so then the next two years comes, comes along and we have another workshop and, and we decided not to have it in Forest Grove. Um, one of the, uh, one of the, the people who had attended the first year said, um, uh, you know, the location was nice. If you like to read, there just wasn't a lot going on in town. And, and so, <laughs> to read. To read. Yeah. so, um, you know, uh, we found, I can't remember where we went the second year. It might've been Reno. Um, I was thinking Reno is pretty early on. I think it was, I think, I think it was Reno. Um, and, um, and then by then Linda Wiseman was uh, on staff and she was really, really good at organizing and planning details. And then she and I planned, you know, for the next 20 years, uh, yeah. the conferences. So um, that was, we were a good team working together on that, but it was, it was quite the learning experience. And, and, I became a lot more comfortable talking in front of people and um, planning and 
it was, you know, I'm really glad now. I, I, I always enjoyed them. I enjoyed having all of our people in one room. Yeah. There's a, there's a fun energy. Um, you, you know, it, it, I'm a big believer in uh, sitting down and eating food with people. If mm-hmm. uh, even people that you may have challenges with, um, if you can sit down and have food sometimes with somebody, sometimes especially, sometimes especially, especially, yeah, that's right, that's right. It's kind of a big equalizer, and you you get to know somebody at, at, at our workshops and now Story Connect. You get to know people on a personal level. You you get to talk about their kids and their dogs and their cats and um, what they like to do and what they like to eat. And it's not all business. And 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 you know just like we are helping our utilities build relationships with their members or their customers, we need to do the same thing. And and Story Connect is a great opportunity for that. I'm a big fan of that. What does that tell us about being flexible? Uh, you know, I guess when you're the new guy and the boss says you got to go try something, you don't have really a lot of opportunity uh, whether or not you're going to be flexible. But I don't know one thing that that you've done your whole career is is adapt and be flexible. We talked about on the technical side with with the photography, you know, changing from the darkroom uh, days until you know modern digital photography, the roles changing. What what do you think your career teaches folks or can teach folks about remaining uh, adaptable and flexible over the years? Hmm. Um, you know, for me, I, I, I'm always interested in learning. I, I, I've, I've been a lifelong learner. I don't plan on stopping, um, when I retire. Um, I like a challenge. I, I, I like it when people come to me and say, Oh, you're not going to be able to figure this out. Eh, we'll see. Um, <laughs> I, I don't like to be stumped. Um, and, um, you know, early on at Rural Light, I was also, a lot of people don't know this, I was also the IT person. We didn't have I was IT just person. about to bring that up. Yeah, kind of the, yeah. the de facto, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I first started, we had a, a bunch of Macs with no net, well, we had an Apple Talk network. Um, we had uh, no backup drives. We had no network servers, no print servers, no internet. Um, yes, I started before the internet. We had no email. Um, and um, so when those things started becoming options, being the young guy and the most technically savvy in the building, it kind of fell on me to figure out how to make that stuff work. And, you know, our first email address was an AOL address off of one of those, off of one of those floppy drives that everybody got in the mail. Uh-huh. And we had a, we had a, a computer, uh, that was in kind of a public space. And, uh, I ran a 50 foot phone cord to it and a, and a 1200 baud modem. And, and we would, you know, stretch that out once a week and check our email. And, um, you know, it, that, it's that, now that part of it actually sounds kind of nice. Only checking email once a week. I got to, I know, gotta right. That. <laughs> yeah. Everything else came via FedEx and UPS, uh, back in the day when a FedEx envelope was 10 bucks overnight. And, um, and that's how people delivered their, their floppy drives, their film negatives. And sometimes mm-hmm. there, you know, sometimes it was just hard copy, um, and we would have to retype it. Um, wow. Yeah. Things have changed. You've had to adapt. Um, That's right. Yeah, definitely. One of the ways that, you know, you mentioned lifelong learner. That's something that, uh, that I'll back you up on. Um, one of the ways that, that we kind of got to know each other was through a, a reading group um, that was started among some pioneer staff. Um, but the, the focus of that reading group, and I think you were a founding member. I came in a couple of books into mm-hmm. it. Um, the, focus of that reading group was diversity and inclusion and trying to understand perspectives of folks that are different than us. And that's, um, you know, just to be, to be frank and and blunt on here, that's not something that a lot of guys, um, you know, looking two or three years from retirement are really looking to dive into, but, but, but you did, why is it that you think uh, diversity matters uh, in order to be a good good storyteller a good communicator 
Well, you know, we started that uh, we started that book group as as part of the learning process for our our, uh, our internship program that mm -hmm. uh, was a focus for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, I just knew I needed to know more. Um, and you know, lifelong learner. Um, I you know I grew up in a time that and and in a small farm community that um, maybe wasn't the most diverse and it wasn't the most open to uh, other races and 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 just you know it I'm trying to find the best way to say this but um, uh, let's just say that if I could go back in time I would I would live that part of my life differently hmm. and um, but I can't, I sure. can't go back in time, but what I can do is change where I'm at now. And, um, you know, I give my wife a lot of credit for this. She teaches, um, ESL, uh, English as a second language. Okay. And, um, and I have learned a lot through her. Um, you know, she comes home almost daily with stories uh, about uh, the the students that she teaches and the challenges they face um, just in school because of the language barrier. And, you know, those kids show up here and they're just kids and they didn't ask to be kids who don't understand English. They didn't ask to be kids born in another country. They're just kids sure. and they're here and they're, they're, you know, they just want to learn. They want to be loved. They want to be understood and they want to have friends and be able to play with their friends and, and do things that all of our kids want to do as well. And um, yet they face roadblocks because of the language and, and oftentimes because of the color of their skin. And, and I think that's wrong. I think it's a shame. And um, if, if I can do something to help make that better, I'm going to do that. Um, and so the book club was um, part of a group of us that just, we, you know, we realize we have shortcomings and, and that's kind of the first step to, to doing something better, right? Is acknowledging what the problem is and acknowledging that, okay, well, I've got a problem. How do I fix it? Um, being a person who likes to learn and, and, and there were people my you know, there were coworkers in this group who were farther along in their journey than me. And I knew I could learn from them. And I was very happy to be able to do that. And so I, it, it's been really gratifying to me. And I, and I have seen that, you know, a lot of aha moments as, as I read, I've read through the many books we've been through, um, you know, and, and I don't necessarily agree with everything we've read. I don't necessarily sure. agree or, you know, it's, there are a lot of viewpoints and a lot of things to learn um, and different different ideas, different subjects hit all of us differently. Um, but with, that's been the fun part is, is talking about that um, with each other and, um, and, and hearing each other's personal stories about how, how it does affect them and, and the learns we've had. Um, so I, I, I really like the direction we're going um, uh, in the company. We, we've had a very successful DEI internship program. Uh, we've, uh, we've actually, uh, we've, we had uh, our very first intern, uh, now works for, um, powerful web, powerful web uh, team. Yep. Yep. And, uh, we have another intern that works on our social media team that, that we hired. Um, so I, I think that's, that says we're doing a pretty good job of, of hiring people, um, and, and, and finding gems that we, um, we can either help stay in the industry, whether it's here or elsewhere. Um, I it's, it's just been, it's been nice. And it's been fun watching my coworkers grow too. Um, I, you know, if, like I said, if we can make, if we can just make it a little bit better, if everything we do makes things just a little bit better. That's, that's a good goal. Well said, well said. And uh, that internship program, something, I know too that that uh, that you have been a, a big part of since the very beginning. 
Last question I had for you. What advice do you have for somebody? I mean, you're, you're, you're the wise sage one, uh, 31 years into this, um, know a few things. What advice do you have for somebody who's just starting out in the, uh, well, whether they're just starting out or whether they're kind of uh, mid-career in the, um, in the telecom utility communications uh, space? Hmm. Well, you know, I know early on, I had people reaching out to me, offering me help. And, and I came from the newspaper world where you learn to be skeptical and um, kind of keep people at arm's length because you just didn't know, you figured somebody, everybody was trying to work you. And, and it took me a while to realize that in this industry, people really are just trying to help people. And uh, there's not another agenda. They, they genuinely, if they see that you might have have a need for information and they have it and they they will are willing to share it and i was not open to that information early on in my career and um that slowed my uh my knowledge growth uh curve a little bit um and and over time i have learned to be much quicker to listen to somebody else's experience and say hmm that okay all right, I see you're just trying to help me. You know, I still may agree or disagree with what they're trying to tell me, but I'm a lot more open to listening and um, and and considering what I'm hearing uh, and considering it with a with the view that this is information they're sharing with me because they want me to be successful. And looking at things from that lens really makes a difference. Um, so I would encourage people. If you're talking to somebody from the industry and and they're trying to trying to steer you in a certain direction, give it a listen because they may be just trying to help you and, and there may be some really valuable information there that um, you'll be happy to have. Absolutely. I get that. Um, sometimes easier. I mean, it sounds simple, but sometimes it could be tough, tough to do. I understand that. Well, Mike, thanks so much for uh, for you being the helper, um, for you helping uh, you know folks in their career. Hopefully, if they're listening to this and they've they've picked up a few things along the way. Congratulations on your retirement, and thanks for taking a few minutes to to record with me here. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate it. He is Mike T. Garden. He is the soon to be retired editorial director here at Pioneer. I'm your host, Andy Johns, and until we talk again, keep telling your story. Connect is produced by Pioneer Utility Resources, a communications cooperative that is built to share your story. Story Connect is engineered by Lucas Smith of Lucky Sound Studio. 